know well is the lost son, the prodigal son, follows that. And with all of these, there is a real swing in emotion from the grumbling of the Pharisees and the scribes all the way to the joy in heaven. And so the swing of grumbling and resentment to joyous jubilation. So Jesus is sitting and eating with those in society that have been marginalized, those ones that are on the outside, cast to the side. And that upsets the Pharisees and the scribes incredibly. Because they see them as unworthy. The wrong people. Because sharing table fellowship, sharing a meal with someone, says that you accept them for who they are. And the Pharisees and the scribes are saying, these are the wrong people at your table. They're not worthy. And so they start grumbling. And they have a lot of resentment. And so Jesus acts, reacts to his strongest critics by telling these three parables. And in each of the parables, the de details are different, but the message that comes from each of them is the same. And so that message at its most basic level is this, that we are to be joyous and celebrate life restored to Christ rather than to be resentful that someone doesn't deserve it. Somehow they're not worthy of deserving that. So we're to be joyous and celebrate life restored to Christ rather than to be resentful that the restored person is somehow not worthy or deserving of God's grace and mercy. So that's at the heart of all three of these parables. And so the tax collectors and sinners, they come to listen to Jesus. They know that they're not living good lives. The tax collectors are stealing money from people. They know they're living sinful lives. But they know if they're coming to Jesus that they're going to hear something that they need. Their hearts and their minds are open to what Jesus has to say. And that is the complete opposite of the Pharisees and the scribes who do not have any godly care in them least in this story, but rather they have harsh judgment, and they are consumed with resentment. The fact that Jesus would share a meal with someone who is undeserving, as far as they're concerned, is deeply troubling to them. So to address the issues, Jesus shares those three consecutive parables, and in the first part of the parable, and the first two, we are asked, what is the value of the thing that is lost? What is the value of the sheep? What is the value of the coin? Basically, what is the value of the soul that is lost? He says, if we have a hundred sheep, and if the very best of that flock is lost, how much effort are we going to go put in to find it? He's also asking, if that sheep that is lost is the weakest of the flock, as the mangiest coat is limping and is weak, are we going to put the same effort into going to find it as the prize of the flock? Will we put in the same effort, or will we leave the weak one for food as to the coyotes? And then the parable of the lost coin sets that similar stage. Will we put as much effort in looking for a hundred dollar coin as we do a dime? Will we put as much effort for looking for a hundred dollar coin as a dime? And so Jesus is seeking out and he's sharing his table. He's sharing a meal with the tax collectors and sinners. And says that he is fully willing to put as much effort into the weakest sheep that is lost <coughs> and to the dime that's lost. It doesn't matter if it's a hundred dollar coin or a dime, he's going to put in as much effort to find that. He's going to put as much effort into finding each one of us, whether we deserve that or not. He's going to put as much effort because we are all valued the same in God's eyes. We have the same value. So the Pharisees and scribes, they don't see it that way. They're 
seeing it through their earthly eyes that some folks are more deserving than others. And so these parables really kind of shine a light on the differences between our human nature and God's nature. In human nature, we have a class system. Whether we want it or not, there is. And it's sometimes more defined in some cultures than ours. But it's there. But in God's eyes, in God's nature, we are all equal and all deserving of what he has to give. And he will put as much effort in to all of us. So the second half of those parables is about how we're supposed to respond when someone is found, when something is found. And again, that shows the difference between God's nature and our nature. The Pharisees are grumbling with resentment. <coughs> Well, God is rejoicing with unrestrained joy. If we think of the parable that we don't read today, and that's the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son, think about the older brother when the young brother comes back after a life of destitution, frankly, and how upset he is that the father is throwing the one that came back a party. He says he's not deserving of that. The difference between our nature and God's nature. So Jesus is saying to the greatest of his critics in this scene, don't you know what you're supposed to have joy in? Don't you know the kinds of things that release joy in heaven and on earth? Why are you consumed with resentment when you should be over the moon with joy and celebration? It says in our text, and just think how many times it says the word rejoice. When he found the sheep, he lays it on his shoulder and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. It becomes a community celebration. When she found the coin, she calls together all her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that had lost. And both of the parables end with very similar statements. In the first one, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. And then in the second, just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. God's nature is different than human nature. And so we see our value and the value of others differently than how God views our value. God sees our value as infinite. <coughs> infinite value. There is great joy in heaven when one comes back to the community of faith, back into relationship with God, and it should be a community celebration. I made the comment at the beginning that at the basic level of this set of parables, that we are to be joyous and celebrate the one that is lost, the one that has a life restored back to Christ, rather than being resentful that perhaps they don't deserve that, or they're not worthy of that, that they're not worthy and, de and uh, deserving of God's grace and mercy. So how do we respond in God's joy and not in the resentment of the Pharisees and scribes that are in our story today. How do we respond with joy and not in resentment? At the core, resentment is feeling that another person has something that they don't deserve or they have more than they deserve. Resentment is packaged as jealousy and anger. And if it's not kept in check, it can consume us quite quickly. And it can have a huge hold on us. And unfortunately, in Jesus' time, it did have a hold on them. And it has a hold on us in our time as well, in our culture. I keenly remember one of my professors in seminary. He says, the only cure for resentment is gratitude. The only cure for resentment is gratitude. 
Gratitude is a learned behavior. It's learned. It's what we teach our kids. And we have to be reminded of it all the time. Because resentment sneaks in way too easily. But we need to learn to be grateful. And only when we're grateful for what we have can we be joyful for what others have. Because when we have joy and being grateful for what we have, we are content. We are at peace with ourselves and we're not comparing ourselves to one another. And that's where the joy comes in. When you're content and grateful for the things that you have. And we can have a celebration as a community of people. Let me give you an example from this week. So being human myself, I struggle with this too. Just like all of us do. Being grateful and having a little bit of resentment. So this week, it's been two weeks since I've been on my bike. You know how cycling is important to me. It keeps this thing kind of spinning right. Keeps my heart energized. So it's been two weeks. Some of it's been due to weather, and a lot of it's been due to schedule. And so this week has been particularly busy. And so Friday, I was getting filled with a little resentment, maybe a whole bunch of resentment. Because I had to leave my clinic early, an hour and a quarter, to come up here to do a rehearsal for a wedding. And my husband, God love him, was out cycling. <laughs> it was beautiful out. And I am so thankful and grateful that he can go out and take his bike and not feel that he can only go when I'm available because he'd be robbing himself of that joy and what he needs as well. But I'm leaving work to come up here and he's cycling. And I can tell you I was turning off of 29th Avenue onto Highway 13 and I literally said to myself, Lynn, you better preach your own sermon to yourself right now. <laughs> because you just got caught. You got caught into a cycle. And so I had to say, what am I grateful for? Well, I'm grateful for a call to be a part of people's lives in a way that makes a difference. I'm grateful that I have a vehicle that I can get to both places. I am grateful that I get do the things that I do, that God has given me the talents and the heart and the abilities and the health to do them. And not too far off Highway 13, my persona, my whole being was changing. I now had a restored heart of gratitude than I did about 20 minutes before that. It happens to us way too easy. And when we come into the Thanksgiving season, we're going to see a lot of ads on TV, and they're all going to tell us what we're supposed to have. Not what we want, but what we need, right? All those gadgets and all those things, and we'll get our mailbox full of stuff of what we need. And they're going to tell us what we need. And Art's ready to tell a story. <laughs> go! You're grateful that you have a husband that can go bicycle. Yes, I am grateful for that. Because we get to share that experience together. I am grateful for that. And so resentment can come in very quickly because all of that is going to tell us what we need and maybe we can't have it. And so we get resentful of the people who do. That maybe they have too much. And why don't I have that? And so it's a time. This week in our worship um, planning meeting, we started thinking about things that we're going to be doing. And very organically this week, and that's how the Holy Spirit works, is this idea of attitude of gratitude. And that's really coming to the surface to kind of be our guiding principle for this next year, the things that we do and the things, how we worship. And one of those things uh, that we want to undertake is called a reverse advent calendar. 
You know those Advent calendars every day uh, of Advent, you open a little window and you get a chocolate or something? A reverse Advent calendar is something entirely different. Instead of getting something, you give something. So each day you take something from your pantry and put it into a bag, then we'll gather together and give it all to the food bank. And we're gonna start that, and there's gonna be a lot of more information about that, but we're gonna start that on Reformation Sunday and take it all the way through and then celebrate our gratitude for all the things that we have when we come together on Thanksgiving worship service, which this year will be on a Sunday evening before Thanksgiving. And so that act of gratitude is a learned response. We need to teach it, we need to remind ourselves because resentment, anger, jealousy, those things are real and they happen to all of us, just as easy as it happened to me on Friday. And God allowed me to recognize that, and I preached my own sermon to myself on that day. So attitude of gratitude, it's a focus. To be grateful, and then to be able to celebrate as a community those that are lost and then found. Because our value to God is equal all the way across the board. Thank God for God's nature instead of ours. With that, we say that.